Now, it wasn't just restricted to drug abuse. It was everything. So I had uh, responsibility mm. for boys and girls clubs or big dinners on the West Coast with celebrities. So I got to meet a lot of people during this time. All kinds of people I never thought I'd meet. Hi, and welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we have a very special podcast to talk with and to learn the story of a very special friend of the Joshua Fund, Mr. Ken Barron. Ken, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Carl. It's a honor to be with you today. Well, uh, so you're joining us, uh, I think, from North Carolina. Is that right? Yes, I'm in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a little chilly here, uh, but it's a great place, and it, it is a wonderful place for people, uh, certainly of faith, and certainly uh, where God destined uh, me and most of my family to be. Sure. Well, I know our viewers will be uh, very interested in knowing a little bit uh, about your story, but tell us, what is it that you do right now? What role do you have? Well, I'm... Uh, obviously with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and was uh, blessed to be called here by the Lord uh, back in 2007. I joined the organization. It just seems like time flies so quickly. But my job here is to oversee all of the communications areas, uh, support all the other ministries that we do here with communications and fundraising, uh, donor ministries, we call it, and relationships, uh, government relations, most all the relationships outside of the ministry, as well as support for the ministries that we do from here. So it's a pretty big portfolio, not unlike most of the things that I've done in my life, uh, kind of a job that I want to say I made it up, but I didn't make it up. God made it up. Every job I've ever had has been just a uh, hybrid of a bunch of things. Sure. Well, you've got uh, amazing responsibilities there at the BGEA, and also, you know, your work uh, throughout the world uh, has brought you in contact with us at the Joshua Fund. You've been a friend of Joel's and mine for a number of years, and uh, and we're we're just thrilled to have you on this podcast. But what we're most excited about, I think, is the narrative story of where you've come from and how you got there. I mean, I'm going to give a little bit away here. But we want to hear your story, Ken, about how you became the vice president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. It's a big answer to a, a question. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't know how I managed to do this because I haven't managed to do it. And I have to start out by saying uh, of all the things I've done in my life, which have been many, many, many things, not as vocations, but experiences when I finally accepted Christ at the ripe old age of 53, I knew that it had all been part of a bigger plan than I ever had. Uh, I grew up in New York City, uh, Lower East Side of New York, Jewish family, uh, Orthodox Jewish family, uh, then evolved into a conservative Jewish family, raised like any other Jewish kid, going to be bar mitzvahed at the age of 13. And after that, I uh, kind of left home uh, mentally. That was in the, remember in the 60s, and I wound up getting into drugs. My parents sent me to a military school in New York, which was just another breeding ground for juvenile delinquents. And from there, I got into drugs eventually to heroin, traveled uh, around the country with a buddy of mine who had just come back from Vietnam, uh, who was my best friend as a young man, wound up seeing the entire country from uh, East Coast to West Coast and settled in Texas, after doing the whole hippie thing, I done the whole hippie thing too, and that wasn't, you know, it wasn't pseudo hippie. It was real hippie days. It was, it was, you know, Beatles, Rolling Stones, the whole bit. But it, it turned out from love child to drug addict, and uh, went into a drug mm-hmm. program in Houston. Eventually, after several attempts, my parents had uh, disowned me a few years before. Uh, literally disowned me. And my dad said he never wanted to see me again. And uh, Mm. from the age of probably 16, I was very independent and dependent on drugs, but independent from family. 
And I wound up in this drug program called Centercore Therapeutic Community, which was based off of a program named Synanon on the West Coast. And you'd live there never by yourself. You were always accompanied or accompanying somebody else. And, and the, it was all run by addicts. There were no outside uh, people. There were no professional degreed people. And it worked very well. And we lived there 24-7 at a facility in uh, Houston and Colorado and Louisiana, uh, another one in Houston. And eventually, after living there for several years, it's incredible, that became my job. I graduated after three years or completed the program after three years and then stayed on as a counselor and then moved up till finally. Uh, and this is a great story. We'll save that for another time. And I was elected president of the organization, and I didn't know what I was doing. Carl, I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> but I had uh, I had some skills I, that God gave me, uh, making friends and building relationships. So we started a cottage industry. We did stuff in a building. We bought the old William Penn Hotel building in downtown Houston. And on the, one of the floors, we turned it into a manufacturing floor and started producing football equipment for the NFL. And that got the attention uh, because we didn't get any federal fund, got the attention of the White House. And I'm skipping through a lot. Uh, President Reagan came to visit. Yeah. And uh, I spent a couple of hours with him talking, which threw the whole schedule off. But he wanted to know so much. He was so interested. And then when he was going to speak to the residents of the program and their families that had come in, there were about 200 residents Mm -hmm. and then probably five or 600 people there. And he asked me a question. He said, Ken, would it be okay if I told the residents that their body is the temple of their spirit? Of course, referring to scripture. I didn't know. I didn't know it was scripture. And I said, you can tell them anything you want. You're the president. So he did that. (laughs) And uh, about two days later, I got a call from James Baker, his chief of staff and uh, asked me to come to Washington. He wanted to talk to me. So I'd never been to the White House and I never got paid. One thing that I have never seemed to do is get paid. And uh, financially, finances and I don't <laughs> seem to jive. I have other skills. So he calls me, I'm wearing donated <laughs> clothes, driving a donated car, eating donated food, all at this drug program. Fortunately, we had some wealthy people who donated their clothes to us. So I had a nice suit and went up to Washington uh, <laughs> A little, a little overwhelmed and uh, sat in the White House with, with Mr. Baker. And uh, he had some other issues, personal issues he wanted to talk to me about, family issues, unrelated to politics or anything. But at the end of the meeting, he said, you want to go meet the president? I see the president. And I said, sure. So we went over and uh, we were in the West Wing, but he was rehearsing for a press conference which I thought was pretty funny. and uh, But all this comes back to roost now yeah. when you see things happen. And he was rehearsing. He came out of the rehearsal, sure. which actually wound up being in the theater in the White House, which was directly under my office to be when I wound up working at the White House. But uh, he came out and said, Hey, Ken, how are you? I just saw you a few days ago. I'm su- somebody must have told him my name, so he remembered. And then after... We walked back over to the Oval Office from the East Wing to the West Wing and talked for a few minutes. And then uh, I was in a room with guys like Lynn Knopfsinger, um, trying to think of all the people that were there. Ed Meese was there. George Bush was there. And they're all talking about the campaign. And I'm sitting in the room. I have no business sitting there. Nothing. I mean, I'm a drug addict, a Jewish (laughs) kid from New York. And I'm sitting in the White House with these guys who are all, you know, very famous, Lee Atwater was the uh, head yeah. of the campaign. And they said, yeah. you know, Ken, we saw what you did with drug addicts. We'd like you to come work on the campaign because just think what you could do with Republicans. And I thought that was a great story. <laughs> that's, that's so I worked on story. the campaign. <laughs> uh, after the campaign, the president, uh, they offered me a job. So I would leave the drug program, went uh-huh. to Washington, took a job as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, for public affairs, no idea what I was doing. Now, I had finished, I'd gone wow. back to school while I was in the drug program and got a degree and then a degree in, at the University of Houston, main campus, which I'm very happy with. It took me many years to get it, but I got it and went on to get honorary degrees and all kinds of crazy stuff. But 
I had no business being anywhere that I was. But I stayed <laughs> at the White House about four years. Wow. While I was in the job, I got a call from the White House, and it was Jim Rosebush, Mrs. Reagan's chief of staff. And I had met him many times right. and he said, during the campaign. He said, Ken, can you come over? Mrs. Reagan wants to see you. And I was at the Department of Health and Human Services, and Margaret Heckler was the secretary there at the time. And I guess they had called her first because she came running to my office and said, I know Nancy wants to see you. And it's funny because... I found out over the years, people only called uh, Nancy, Nancy when she was very close friends with. Uh, we always called her Mrs. Reagan. Uh, mm. I got very close to her, but I Mrs. never Reagan. called her Nancy. Sure. And same thing with Mr. Graham. <laughs> we all call Billy Graham Mr. Graham. Uh, nobody yeah. calls him Billy unless they were very close yeah. to him. You know, Cliff Barrows or, or yeah. uh, George Beverly Shea. Those guys called him Billy, but... Not us. And same thing with Nancy. And so as soon as somebody says Nancy, that grimace, and I knew she wasn't very close to Nancy Reagan. But I went yeah. over to the White House. I sat with Mrs. Reagan yeah. for two hours on this red and white couch. And there's a picture in my office here. It's across the room of that couch with yeah. Billy Graham and Mrs. Graham sitting with the Reagans on the same couch. So I got this picture. I wanted this picture in my office. Reagans. Wow. And recently, when I was up in D.C. doing the 100th anniversary uh, kind of reunion, they had this couch, the same couch in the Reagan wow. Institute in D.C. Little things that you remember. But anyway, so I, I went over and then she, sure. I didn't realize she was offering me a job. It was an interview for a job. And I sat on this couch with her for a couple mm -hmm. hours. She's crying. Mm -hmm. I'm crying about my story. There's a lot more behind this, Carl, that I just couldn't take the time to tell you. A lot of things happened yeah, and you're, in those years that were yeah, very dramatic. A, a marriage in there, a child losing that, that eventually became more dramatic. But things that would really touch yeah. both of us at the time. So she said, so Jim Rosebush came back in after a couple hours into the residence at the White House and said, uh, Mrs. Reagan, are you done with Ken? And she said, oh, yes. And she said, Ken, I'm going to enjoy having you work for me. I said, well, I'm just down the street at the Department of Health and Human Services whenever you need me. And she said, oh, no, I want you working right here at the White House. And and Jim Rosebush said, uh, Mrs. Wow. Reagan, uh, he interrupted her and said, you realize this is just an interview. And she said, what does that mean, Jim? She <laughs> said, well, we have other candidates for you to talk to. And she said, I don't need any other candidates. Ken will do just fine. And I'm like flabbergasted. <laughs> wow. Now, I had gotten married in the drug program. That's another long story. But right. anyway, my wife was a very liberal. She was not of the conservative Republican ilk that I had become working on the campaign. And uh, Tim Baker called me to his office right after the interview and I said, well, Mrs. Reagan, well, before that, I said, Mrs. Reagan, I would really enjoy that. Went down to Jim Baker's office. He said, Ken, got good news and bad news. I said, okay. He said, the good news is Mrs. Reagan really likes you. I said, oh, that's nice. He <laughs> said, that's good news for all of us. And then he said, the bad news is you got to take a cut and pay. I said, oh, okay, well, how much? And I had gotten, mm -hmm. somehow they had grossed me up to the highest pay you could get there as a civil servant or whatever the position was called civil it servant, yeah seventy two thousand dollars a year which was a lot then so uh i said well how much am i going to make he said sixty thousand dollars a year it's a twelve thousand dollar cut but carl i had been making nothing before this remember i told you yeah. donated car now yeah i had moved out of the program when i got became head of it for like a year and a half and they yeah. were paying me twenty five thousand dollars a year but for the all those years before that, I hadn't made wow. a penny. Well, I was going to say, we're going to take a break right here uh, because I know there's there's a lot more to this part of the story. And there's a lot more about what you've done in the intervening years, too, we want to touch base on. But let's take a quick break right now, if that's okay. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg, founder and chairman of the Joshua Fund. And I've got exciting news. In 2023, I'm inviting you 
on behalf of our entire board and staff to come to the Holy Land, to come to Israel on the next prayer and vision tour. This is the 75th anniversary of the prophetic rebirth of the modern state of Israel back in 1948. And what is God doing here? It's amazing, spiritually, economically, in so many ways, there's been so much growth, so much progress, but the best is yet to come. And we want you to see it. We want you to walk where Jesus walked. We want you to see where the apostles ministered. We want you to see where people's lives were transformed by the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We want you to see this city where Jesus died and rose again and where he's coming back, I hope soon. But in the meantime, come to Israel with the Joshua Fund. You can learn more about the trip, the itinerary, the cost, all the details at joshuafund.com. But sign up quickly because I think this thing is going to fill up fast. The Prayer and Vision Tour of Israel in the fall of 2023. I hope to see you there. So Ken, we're back and we took that break right at a point where you were you were talking to the White House about coming to work there. What were they asking you to do? And, and what was that all about in terms of your next step? You know, in the jobs I, I had, and there really only been three organizations I've worked for, four actually, I never knew what the job was going to be. Uh, I had no clue, had no skills for any of them, uh, as you'll hear. Uh, this one, uh, over at the Department of Health and Human Services, they wanted me to do all the public affairs, public uh, relations with partnering groups. And I didn't even have time to get into it. I was there two weeks just finding my way around the building when I got this call from Mrs. Reagan to come to the White House. So I had spent six weeks at Department of Health and Human Services, which wasn't enough time to do anything, and then went to the White House as director of projects for Mrs. Reagan. And because of her interest in drug abuse and my background, certainly as an addict and then as a running a program, she felt that that was pretty good qualifications for what she needed. So my job was to sort out all the letters she got uh, requesting her to do things. Now, it wasn't just restricted to drug abuse. It was everything. So I had uh, responsibility mm. for boys and girls clubs or big dinners on the West Coast with celebrities. So I got to meet a lot of people during this time, all kinds of people I never thought I'd meet. I ran the White House uh, tennis tournament, and we brought in people. And then I did uh, UN uh, First Ladies Conference on Drug Abuse at the United Nations, which we had 26 First Ladies there. It was quite something. But the biggest part was starting the Just Say No program, which Mrs. Reagan had responded to a yes. child at a get-together, a, a thing we had set up at a school in uh, Oakland, California, and she was asked a question by one of the kids, what should you say if someone offers you drugs? <laughs> and Mrs. Reagan, her own naive way, said, well, just say no. And that became the slogan for that program mm -hmm. that went around the world. And so mm -hmm. that became kind of the thing that stuck yeah. to me in my right. job there is developing this program. It was really a grassroots program. It started with parents' groups and kids groups in sure. school, and they started just say no clubs. It was one of these things that just happened. But again, I guess I got tagged with it, yeah. but really I didn't have much to do with it. I just kept it going. So God put me in that spot. Sure. Well, Ken, you also wrote a book uh, later titled When Saying No Is Not Enough, right? Uh, That's you, correct. Can you just take a moment and tell us a, a little bit about how the approach in your book talks about how parents can approach their kids if they suspect their kids are on drugs. Yeah, I, I, Just a quick moment on that. I wish I could write it again. I wish I was a Joel Rosenberg and I could just prolifically write like he does, but I'm not. I could really renew that and give a lot better advice now after, you know, like 50 years in the business. Uh, but it was really an approach to say there is help, mm -hmm. how to talk to your children about drugs, how to spot the things that would uh, point to drug abuse. I think now I would approach it more as how to react to your children, how to teach them what not to do, how to build character. That wasn't part of that book as much as finding treatment programs, how to approach it and how to look for it. So, uh, but it was effective. Mm -hmm. It did very well, I guess, as far as books go, it did well. I wouldn't change much of it now. I would just uh, add some more to it. I could do more. 
Yeah, well, I'm sure. But, you know, that's it's so important to look at how that trajectory in, from a drug addict to the director of the Just Say No initiative <laughs> and someone who's had that experience. You can take us through that conversion from a Jewish drug addict kid to, to Jesus and then ultimately, you know, where you are now and, and some of the things that, that are happening with your well, with your current work and your current loves. The biggest surprise to me was after that. I, I didn't know how to get a job. And, and everybody at the White House kept saying, you know, this is going to this term's going to be up and everybody's going to be looking for jobs. So start looking for things while you're meeting people. And back then it was a little bit different. I think the political world was much more cohesive than it is today. There aren't the two sides that back then. President Reagan had this very congenial relationship with uh, Tip O'Neill and the Republicans and Democrats pretty much were together. I, I'll tell you, I could write books about that, that we were friends with a lot of people and didn't have this animosity or this polarization mm -hmm. that exists today uh, because I think leadership said that sure. way. President Reagan was a perfect example of a good Christian man. Uh, Mrs. Reagan strayed a little mm -hmm. bit with her uh, astrology, but he lived a Christian life and I think he liked everybody. And some of it may have been a little naive, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what, he brought people together and everybody did work together there. But with, so when these people are telling me, you better start looking for a job, Ken. This is something that was probably the most illegal thing I, I've done. Uh, I hate to say that, but of course, when I was using drugs, I did some pretty bad things. But I got a news. We didn't have computers or cell phones. Remember that. This is the 80s. The cell phones iPhone didn't come out until 2007 when I came to Billy Graham, 2007. So now we're back in the mm -hmm. 80s. And I bought a Newsweek magazine or a Business Week that had the top 100 CEOs and their salaries. And I started calling them up. And I'd call their office and say, uh, the secretary would answer, whoever I'd say, this is Ken Barron from the White House. I'd like to speak to Mr. Smith. And they would say, oh, Mr. Barron, uh, He's in a meeting right now. Can I right take a message? I gave him my number. And then they'd invariably say, can I tell him what it's about? And I would say, it's personal. Well, you get a call from somebody at the White House <laughs> and they say it's personal. They always call back. So <laughs> I got six <laughs> job offers out of that. And the one I did not get was uh, one from McDonald's. I got a call from Jim Rosebush again, the guy who was Mrs. Reagan's chief of staff when I got hired. And Jim said, Ken, I know you're probably looking for another job like everybody else. I've got a lead on the job with McDonald's. And I'm going, hey, hmm. look, I lived in the streets. I actually at one point lived under a bridge in Houston while I was an addict uh, on a methadone program. Hmm. I was a wreck. I said, I don't mean to sound egotistical or not appreciative, but McDonald's? I mean, I'm in the White House now. Why go to McDonald's? He said, no, this is an executive <laughs> job. I said, oh, well, well, I'll talk to him. Mm. Well, that wound up being 17 interviews later, uh, flying out to meet Joan Kroc in Chicago wow. on Lakeshore Drive, the, the wife of the founder of McDonald's, Ray Kroc. I was uh, offered the job to come in and start a charitable organization for McDonald's which later on became uh, known as wow. Ronald McDonald House Charities. It wow. paid me $100,000 a year, sure. which was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. And sure. a car. Sure. So we packed up and moved to Chicago. Anyway, uh, we started that. <laughs> Ronald McDonald Houses existed. There were about 10 of them when we started, but they were all independent of McDonald's. The name of the charity was called Ronald McDonald Children's Charities. Then we merged everything together. I had no staff for three years. Nobody, just me, piles of these requests because they announced, McDonald's announced they were going to start this charitable organization. Everybody was sending requests for money. Started out with $300,000. Sure. And McDonald's paid my salary. I was a director <laughs> at McDonald's. Eventually, uh, when I left, well, there's so much to this story that that is a book, probably two books in itself about yeah. McDonald's and what happened. And now I'm going to get into the most sure. important part of this. But when I left, we started with $300,000. Uh, I made friends, played racquetball with the CEO of McDonald's, a guy named Mike Quinlan. 
And I finally was able to tell him, look, I need staff. I need people. And he allowed me to hire some people. We got some beautiful offices in the building and we were off. And when I left in 2007, our assets were $1.6 billion. And we had given away $500 million in grants to children's organizations, not just Ronald McDonald House. We developed a caramobile program, sure. family rooms and hospitals. But we also gave to children's organizations all over the world. One of the biggest ones was changing the face of the world. We gave to a bunch of organizations that did cleft palates and cleft lip surgeries. And I got to go on a bunch of those sure. trips. Sure. And uh, I got to go everywhere. I mean, I met more people and did more things than anybody could ever imagine in their lives. From the Dalai Lama yeah. to the Pope to uh, people like Chuck Norris or, you know, movie stars. And then eventually uh, the Duchess of York and the whole royal family. I had just crazy wow. stuff that happened. But God had me on this journey. Wow. I, didn't realize, I didn't realize it. I met a guy. When I first got to McDonald's, named Paul Saber. Paul was a owner of mm -hmm. one McDonald's restaurant in Atlanta. Eventually, tra he traded that one for two restaurants in Albuquerque. And very beginning of the uh, charitable efforts that I was in, Car and Driver magazine came to me and said, "We'd like to do a fundraiser for Ronald McDonald House Charities." I didn't know what I was doing, Carl. I'm telling you. No idea. I said, that ah, sounds great. So we partnered with them, and uh, I was able to get cars for people to drive, like the old Cannonball Run. And we drove from Detroit all the oh, way around right. the northeastern yeah. part of the U.S., down to Virginia, and then back up to Ohio, back to Detroit. Well, Paul wanted to drive in this, Paul Saber. So I said, I'll find a car for you. So one of our friends in Chicago gave us a Ferrari, silver Ferrari, beautiful. So Paul had a friend who drove with him, uh, another Christian friend of his, I found out later. But what happened during the races, cars, we would stop at certain racetracks that car and driver had arranged, and people could take these cars and run them around the track because you couldn't race on the street. So the first race, wow. Paul's co-driver crashed into a wall in this Ferrari. Didn't do a lot of damage, scared him. He didn't want to drive anymore. I was riding in a big bus behind the whole group of cars. So Paul said, why don't, <laughs> why don't you drive with me? Well, it sounded great, but driving in a Ferrari for 72 hours straight was pretty hard. We stopped one time. So I get in the car oh, with man. him, and uh, he starts telling me to drive faster, faster. And I'm going, man, we're going pretty fast. Top was off, and you know we're going down these two-lane highways. <laughs> I'm probably doing about 60 sure. or 70. It felt really fast. He said, go faster, faster. I said, man, you're not afraid to die, are you? He said, no. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, well, I know where I'm going. I said, what does that mean? So he said, yeah. well, let me tell you. He says, I know you're a Jew, but I believe in Jesus. And he started to talk to me about Christianity and his whole world. And I'm going, come on, man. I'm a Jew. I don't need that stuff. I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm, I'm cool. You know, I've come out yeah. of a lot of stuff. I was in a bad marriage. I didn't tell him that. But I said, I'm doing fine. He keeps hammering me. I pull over to the side of the road and say, look, just stop. I respect you for your faith. Respect me for mine, which I didn't have much of at all. I mean, I was a secular, really a secular Jew. And we can get into that a little bit more. But so I pull away from the curb and get back up to speed. He says, now let me tell you about my friend Jesus. And for 10 years, Carl, he talked to me about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 10 years. And I had a Bible on my mm -hmm. desk mm -hmm. that he sent me. I couldn't make head nor tails. I don't know what version it was. It yeah, was yeah. probably a NLV or NIV or a NLT or something like that. But I couldn't make head nor tails of it. Now I'm a Jewish kid, got bar mitzvah, <laughs> read the Torah, didn't know what I was doing, of course, but... I read it. And then, so 10 years went by. I finally got divorced from my wife, which uh, was an amicable divorce. It didn't last very long. But so Paul comes into town with his wife to Chicago. Paul had sold his restaurants back to McDonald's. And by this time, he had yeah. 17 restaurants. 
in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he winds up moving to Rancho Santa Fe. And well, before he did that, when he sold his restaurants back, he came to work for McDonald's for a little while. And he came to uh, Chicago uh, where we were living. And I introduced him to my new wife. And we're sitting at a table in a restaurant owned by a friend of mine. And I said to him, you know, at the risk of insulting my beautiful bride here, who's just the most wonderful woman in the world, I said, I still have this emptiness. I thought marrying her would fill this emptiness inside me. And, you know, over the years, you've been telling me about all the sins mm -hmm. I've, I'm guilty of and the things I've done. And I just don't know how to fill up my life. I don't know how. He said, well, I've been telling you what to do for 10 years. He told me, but he really didn't tell me. And I, I said, what do I need to do? He said, you need to accept Jesus as your personal savior. I said, well, okay, how do we do that? Do I need to go to a synagogue, denounce my Jewishness, or do I have to step on a glass or build a chuppah, or, or what do I have to do? <laughs> and he said, no, just pray with me. And we sat there at that table, and we prayed. And as we prayed, my whole life just came as a vision through my, my eyes, and I was sobbing. I was crying, just crying, and I couldn't stop crying. It was like every time I tried to stop, as we're praying the sinner's prayer, I kept welling up, and I saw my parents go through my life, my brother, and all kinds of experiences. And when I came up, like for air, it was like this whole weight had been lifted off of me. And I was like full of energy and joy. And I said later on, I know what it's like to be born again. The whole question of, wow. you know, Nicodemus, you know, do you have to go back in the womb and, and be born again? Well, that's kind of what it was. I felt this cloud that I was inside yeah. of, and then all of a sudden the veil came off of me and I knew what it was like to be born again. And I said, I never thought I'd be one of those born again Christians, but I became one of those born again Christians. <laughs> and so for the next five years, uh -huh. I was discipled by a pastor in Oak Brook, Illinois, and mm -hmm. thought it was, you know, I was getting a lot, but I really didn't know much. I mean, still, I had a Bible study group once a week. I talked to him, go to church on Sundays, but I really didn't learn that much. Well, five years mm -hmm. goes by, Ronald McDonald House Cherries had grown so much. I had also been given responsibilities for other areas in the corporation. Change of CEOs happened, and the CEO that gave me all these new responsibilities was a great friend of mine. But as time went on at McDonald's, and I'm praying before meetings, and people are thinking, this Jewish guy, what happened to him? He's a born-again Christian. And the CEO gave me responsibility yeah. for animal welfare. Think about animal welfare at McDonald's. You know, you, you give a happy meal to a cow before mm. you slit its throat. You know, it's something like that. Or you, <laughs> and, and then I had, uh, I had environmental affairs under me. I had human rights. And then I had all things. You got nutrition. Easy jobs, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they gave me all the things nobody else wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and I got nutrition, which was really the <laughs> clincher. Two weeks after I got the job heading up nutrition, and the reason I got that was because I was very fit. I was in great shape. And they said, you can represent McDonald's with nutrition. I didn't know anything about it, but I solved the problems of nutrition in a different way, as I did in environmental affairs, as I did in animal welfare. God put these ways in my head that I never would have thought of. And I can come back mm. to that. But mm. 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 I also, uh, in nutrition, because I had to implement some things, I wasn't the loved guy anymore at McDonald's. It was kind of like I used to give away yeah. money and I'd help people out. They'd come to me with a charitable request. I'd try to get it through the board. <laughs> the way I Everybody loves that, yeah. The way I structured the charity was very unique. The way it made it work was very unique. That's a whole book, wow. too, in itself. And then now at McDonald's taking on these other areas, yeah. one of the first things I did was say, well, with PETA and animal welfare, 
what do they want? And nobody has thought to sit down with them and ask mm. them what they wanted us to do, knowing we were the biggest food company in the world. And there were four they things are. I did. Four things I did, which mm -hmm. I won't go into detail, but one had to do with chickens, one had to do with cows, one had to do with the way we stunned cows before we killed them. Things that could be fixed, mm -hmm. but we never asked them. Same thing with nutrition. Mm -hmm. Put more nutritious stuff in Happy Meals, give something to mom when she takes the kids in. So we did all that and got out of the bullseye. Right. But then the spiritual warfare started, which I didn't know about. And yeah, I'm well, sure things started I'm coming sure. at me internally. Well, things started coming at me to make me very uncomfortable. Yeah. But I kept saying, I, I feel like I'm being yeah. called somewhere else. I didn't even know that term. But I went to my pastor and I said, yeah. you know, I feel like I should be doing something else. Maybe I should be a missionary. Yeah. And my pastor said, well, you're doing that. You're giving money to kids organizations <laughs> all over the world. I said, well, maybe you're right. I'll stick it out. Well, I told my friend Paul about this, and he said, look, I'm thinking about going down to North Carolina and helping Franklin Graham and, and Mr. Graham with the Building of Evangelistic Association and Samaritan's Purse. I said, well, my father used to watch Billy Graham on television when I was young, and he always told me I needed to watch this man. Now, this yeah. is a Jewish guy on Saturday afternoon after yeah. school. Well, so I knew the name Billy Graham. I had actually <laughs> met Mr. Graham at a couple of events with the Reagans. And I had gotten That's a call true. from one of the former McDonald's guys that lived down here in North Carolina and said, can you come down and visit the Billy Graham library, the site for the Billy Graham library? I said, but I said, Tom, you know, we don't help religious organizations. And that was my policy because I didn't want to help a bunch of other religious organizations. And he said, yeah, but can you come down? It would do me a big favor. These guys would stop asking me and you give the money away. So I came down and visited. Mm -hmm. And I had an ulterior motive because I could play golf at one of the good golf courses here. <laughs> but I found everybody to be so nice. <laughs> People were wonderful. And yeah. I said, when I got back, I told my wife, there's something about that place. Just wonderful. And the, and the library was just a hole in the ground, man. And we couldn't help it because uh, the board said it was too much a religious organization. We'd wind up getting requests from every organization in the world, which I couldn't uh, support. But that's after that, my friend Paul called me and said, I'm thinking about going down there. Well, I quit at McDonald's. I said, I'm done, guys. They gave me a nice severance, you know, a nice package and not what they were given other senior. But I was a senior vice president by this time. And I, uh, the day I left, I'm driving home, and the phone rings. It's my friend Paul. He says, I really want you to come down to North Carolina. I said, well, maybe I will. And sure enough, uh, I wound up coming down to Billy Graham as a senior vice president. I met Franklin. I, I couldn't have passed the interviews we do now. We've got much more sophisticated, and people ask what your faith <laughs> Walk like I at first I told him, I said, Paul, I can't go down there. I can't. He said, Why? I said, Because there are a bunch of Christians down there. And he said, Well, you're a Christian. <laughs> I said, No, I'm I'm really he said, You're a completed Jew. I said, What does that mean? And then I, you know, it took me a while to figure that out. I met Franklin and Franklin sure. hired me on the spot. But truly, I didn't know anything. I, Bible study or, you know, yeah, things like that. I just wasn't prepared for, for this kind of life. But we moved down here on by faith. I knew that God had given me so much favor in all the ideas I came up with at Ronald McDonald House Charities and all these other areas I had because, Carl, I had no clue that I had the intellectual capacity yeah. to accomplish what had been accomplished. I mean, my life has been a an absolute yeah. crazy experience. And I thought we would never stay in nice hotels and we it wouldn't is. travel as much. And I have been to places with Franklin and the Sudan under war. Uh, obviously, been to Israel 12 sure. times now since I came here. I never went before. And all kinds of crazy well, places. China, India, all, all kinds of crazy places. 
I've got to just ask Ken, you know, like that's how we came into contact with you. Your, your, your love for, uh, you know, the, the work of the Samaritan's person for Billy Graham's evangelistic association and all of that around the world has brought you in, in a very special way into relationship with, uh, with Israel and, and with uh, the work that the Joshua Fund is doing there. And uh, talk to me a little bit about, we just have a few minutes left here, but just talk to me a little bit about your, your love for the, the people of Israel and, uh, you know, with your own unique Jewish background. How yeah, does, let it, me just, how does uh, that let me impact say my, you today? There's so much in my life that's gone on that I could, you know, I can fill up books with this and, and I will at some point. And it's been a blessing. But the most important thing to me has been what God has done. And the, the biggest blessing was we're on a trip mm-hmm. to uh, between Latvia and Lithuania. Franklin was doing two festivals or crusades. That's the, what we still do is festivals quite a bit. We've got a lot of other ministries here at Billy Graham Evangelistic Association to reach people. And we're on this trip and Franklin, we're going for the weekend. We're in between, we have a week in between. And he says, Ken, what are you going to do when you go to Israel? I said, I'm going to kiss the ground. I always wanted to go to Israel, always. In fact, when I was using drugs, that was my goal, was to escape to Israel and go there and live in a kibbutz. And I just thought that that's what I should do. And I read everything I could about Israel. I, I read as, much, as many stories, Bible stories, I guess, and tried to place it. But when I got there with Franklin... He knew we were going to Israel. I did. So we land in, in uh, Tel Aviv, and he says, welcome to Israel. And I go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. And I walk down the stairs of his plane uh, or the Samaritan's purse plane, and I get down on my hands and knees and kiss the ground. And it was just, I felt like I was home. And every minute I spend in Israel is an absolute blessing. It just ties everything together in my life, and it for people that have not been there, it, it is the most striking feeling I think anybody could ever have that has any background in any kind of faith, knowing that everything started there and that Jesus walked there. And I've been to, you know, not as many cities as you guys have, but certainly quite a few with friends. I didn't go on tours. We went with friends and people who lived there and had some Oh, Chase, tremendous experiences. So I loved it there, and I love the way everything fits together. And there's no way that I could doubt Jesus. And certainly when you go back through Scripture and you read so many verses how Jesus came to this earth for Jews, for the people of Israel, uh, for the lost sheep, lost sheep of Israel. That's why Jesus came. I mean, you read that in Scripture, and you go, he came here for me. But when I was a little kid, I used to get chased home from school by Catholic kids saying, you killed Jesus, you killed our Savior. And I didn't know Jesus was then. Wow, Ken, thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our listeners. If you found this podcast valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Are you someone who's searching for Jesus? You can find about him and his purpose for your living right here on this podcast. Do you want to talk about something else on the show? Do you have a question you want Joel to answer? Go to joshuafund.com and click on Contact Us. Your feedback is incredibly valuable as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you might want more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry Team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.